Well, I do that to myself. I told the first crowd to let Matt Chandler preach for five minutes before me. Is he says more than five minutes, and I can often say it in fifty minutes. But uh, thank you very much. <laughs> Some of my new deacons to go and uh, wait a minute, that is a deacon's wife. That is. There is much to be said about that. Jesus is enough. I, you know, you, you get into some some sticky spots in your life, don't you? And you may be here today and you're saying, I'm in one right now. And man, I've, I've made a mess of things and. Um, I'm in trouble. And this message is for you today. You may be one of those that would say, I don't know what happened. I, I'm doing everything I'm supposed to be doing. I'm, I'm in the spot where I think I'm supposed to be. I, I've done all that the Lord's asked of me. I'm, I'm in the Word on a regular basis. I'm showing up to church every week. What's the matter? Why is it still all so messed up? Last week I asked you a question, and by way of review, I'll release it to you again today. What do you do when you're doing what you're supposed to be doing and it all goes wrong anyway? Because it can, you know, there are no guarantees. Today, uh, by way of just laying a foundation for our, our teaching time, I think it's important for us to go back and, and review a little bit of where Israel is and, and the, the plight of the people and the struggle that they're facing. Uh, you know, for 400 years they've been in bondage, generation after generation, slaving away in the hot sun in the Egyptian um, uh, city and, and, and area there, and just under the whip, under the oppression uh, of slave drivers and taskmasters of a wicked king that uh, that desires nothing but their toil and blood, sweat, and tears to make his name more famous. And over and over and over you see uh, just hardship and struggle and persecution, uh, great oppression for a people. And you got to wonder, after generation to generation, what hope is there? For us to look back and talk to our grandparents and, and to see what a different day it was 50 years ago, to see that, man, that they, they, got, they went through some difficult times, but the Lord brought them through. And I gotta think, you know, after generation after generation after generation, what kind of story is being passed down uh, amongst the Israelite people? Yeah, my great 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 great, great grandparents were slaves, and their great 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 grandparents were slaves, and all we have known is oppression. In where do you find hope in that? And where do you where do you even dare? To, to long for freedom when all you've ever known is slavery. So I hope the text today will, will mean something to you. If you find yourself in a, in a dark place, maybe it's a prison that you put yourself in, maybe it is an enslavement to, to, to things or to people or relationships or other situations that would be contrary to what God would have for you and you find yourself in a, in a bad place for that, or maybe, again, you just, you've, you've been doing all the right things and it's just messed up to you. Let's find out about it. I'm going to ask you to turn your Bibles to Exodus chapter 4 today. Um, the primary teaching points will be in, in chapter 6, but just by, I think it's important to, to cover some, some old ground before we get there and make it really pop to us today. Uh, so in verse 29 of chapter 4, it's typically our tradition here when we when we read Scripture aloud together to stand to, in honor of, of God's Word, but I'm going to read the whole chapter today, about 30 verses. And so it's okay to just stay put where you are and if you promise to follow along, okay? Promise? All right, nobody's going to fall asleep while we're uh, just reading this, okay? I want you to stay in tune with it. The story itself is, is very intriguing. In chapter 4, verse 29, it says, Moses and Aaron went and assembled all the elders, the leadership of the sons of Israel. And Aaron spoke all the words which the Lord had spoken to Moses. He then performed the signs in the sight of the people. So the people believed that means they trusted. And when they heard that the Lord was concerned about them and that He had seen their affliction, they bowed low and they worshipped. Get this in your mind. Get the picture in your mind here that after all of this time, that finally a spokesman from God stands before them, performs the work of God, delivers 
the actual words of God. God has written the, his own sermon notes to give to Moses to say, for Moses and Aaron to speak. They've heard the word of the Lord. They've seen the works of the Lord. And now they are gathered together as the people of God. And they're understanding now that after 400 years that he has seen their affliction, he's about to act in that. What would you do? When after all of that hurt, all of that turmoil, after all that hardship, you finally hear the words. He's coming. It's not too much unlike what we see in the New Testament. I forgot to tell the early service about this. But in the New Testament, there's 400 years of silence between the last prophet in the Old Testament before an angel breaks the silence on the hillside outside of Bethlehem and the shepherds get to hear for the first time. Not only he's coming, he's He's here. The one that was promised to you, He's here. Here in Exodus chapter 4 and, and 5, we get to see that God is promising that, yes, it's dark times, it's hard times, it's struggling times for you, but He's coming, I'm coming, I'm coming, and I'm going to rescue you, I'm going to do things that you never even thought were possible. I'm coming for you. And they hear this, and they are moved to bow and to worship. It's a beautiful thing. But then chapter 5 happens. Afterward, Moses and Aaron came and said to Pharaoh, Thus says the Lord. And <laughs> when a prophet says, Thus says the Lord, he's getting ready to deliver some news straight from God. If you ever hear a preacher speak and he just tells you a bunch of funny stories and about his life all the time and all the good things are supposed to happen to you, and he leaves out the thus says the Lord, it's okay to dismiss everything. But once thus says the Lord happens, listen up. Sink it from God. And so Moses says, or Aaron says this in, in for him, thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, let my people go. So they go on vacation together? No. So that they may celebrate a feast to me in the wilderness. But Pharaoh said, who is the Lord that I shall obey his voice and let Israel go? I do not know this Lord, and besides, I will not let Israel go. And then Moses and Aaron came back. The God of the Hebrews has met with us. Please let us go into a three days journey into the wilderness that we may sacrifice to the Lord our God. Otherwise, he will fall upon us with pestilence or with sword. But the king of Egypt said to them, Moses and Aaron, why do you draw the people away from their work? Get back to your labors. Again, Pharaoh said, look, the people of the land are now many, and you would have them cease from their work. So the same day, Pharaoh commanded the taskmasters over the people and their foremen, saying, You are no longer to give the people straw and make brick as previously. Let them go and gather straw for themselves. But the quota of bricks that they're making, you shall impose on them. You're not to reduce any of the quota, because they are lazy. Therefore they cry out, Let us go and sacrifice to our God. Let the labor be heavier on the men. Let them work at it so that they will pay no attention the false words. So the taskmasters of the people and their foremen went out and spoke to the people saying, Thus says Pharaoh, I'm not going to give you any straw. You go out and get straw for yourselves wherever you can find it, but none of your labor will be reduced. So the people had to scatter all through the land of Egypt together some simple stubble for straw. And the taskmasters pressed upon them. That, that, that means they, they pressed hard and they imposed upon them saying, Complete your work quota, your daily amount, just as when you had Straw. Moreover, in verse 14, the foremen of the sons of Israel, whom Pharaoh's taskmasters had set over them, they were beaten. And, were, and, then, they, and then they asked, why have you not completed your, your required amount, either yesterday or today, in making brick as previously? And the foremen of the sons of Israel came and cried out to Pharaoh, of all things, saying, why did you deal with us this way? We're your servants. There's no straw given to your servants. Yet they keep saying this. Make bricks, make bricks. And behold, your servants are being beaten. But it's the fault of your own people. And Pharaoh had no mercy on them. In verse 17, he says, you are lazy. Very lazy. Therefore, you say, let us go and sacrifice to the Lord. Go now and work, for you will be given no straw. Yet you must deliver the quota of the bricks. The foreman of the sons of Israel saw that they were in trouble because they were told he must not reduce. And in verse 20, when they left Pharaoh's presence, they met Moses and Aaron as they were waiting for them. And they cursed them, saying, May the Lord look upon you and judge you, for you have made us odious, or you have made a stink or a stench in Pharaoh's sight, and in the sight of the servants to put a sword in their hand to kill us. And then Moses returned to the Lord. He said, Lord, why? 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 Why, 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 why? Feel like Moses? So 
and on. Everything's just falling apart all around you and all you want to know is why. And you question God. I want to give you some, some things that, as we've seen by, by way of review, two attempts were made at, at going to Pharaoh and preaching a sermon that God had laid out before them. Let my people go. Let them go on a three-day journey into the wilderness so they may celebrate a feast to me and that they may worship me and they may sacrifice to me. It's an attempt that, that, that I'm going to gather my people to me and I'm going to introduce myself to them as Galilee. And, and uh, we're going to fellowship together. We're going to covenant together. And Pharaoh says, I don't know that guy. And according to Pharaoh, who is the God on earth himself, he says, no, there will be no other God. Here there will be no other word. Here is but my will. And another attempt was made. Please let us go into the wilderness. Uh, the God of the Hebrews has called us. Uh, if, if, if we don't go, there, there's gonna, we're going to fall by pestilence and sword. And kind of foreshadowing of what is to come. And Pharaoh says, you're lazy. Get back to work. If you got time for vacation in the wilderness, you got time to sacrifice to God. you got time for more work. He even offered him a counter proposal. Here, i got an idea. Let's make you work harder. We're not going to give you any straw. We're not going to give you the resources needed. But you still got to keep building. you still got to keep making everything that we've asked you to make. And in verse 22, if you'd like to write in your Bible, I'd encourage you to circle or, or underline that first phrase there. And then Moses returned to the Lord. And because we've noticed a, a few verses above that, when the foreman, when the Israelites were being beaten because they weren't meeting their quota, where did they go to? They didn't cry out to God, they went to Pharaoh. And it would be like us saying today, under the oppression and under the burden and under the persecution, we've been in prison for our faith, calling out to Satan. Satan, release me from this sin, this bondage, and this struggle I've got. You don't do that. You, you would never do that. You call out to God, Lord, deliver me and rescue me. But they went to their slave master and asked for relief from their burden. They didn't want freedom anymore. They just wanted an easier life. They had so been under bondage for so long, they just were ready to settle in. But I'm going to give you a positive and a negative that I see in Moses' response here. Because the positive thing is that Moses has returned to the Lord. He, they, Moses and his brother Aaron have just about been beaten up by these guys that have just been beaten and humiliated by Pharaoh's taskmasters. But the positive thing is, is that even though Moses didn't have all this fear today, he's got lots of questions. Write this in your notes today. He took them to God. Moses returned to the Lord and he took all of his questions and he took all of his burdens and he took all of his uncertainties and his bewilderment in this whole situation and he took them to God. And, and, uh, and I like Dunham's quote on this. He said, here's a pristine picture of an honest relationship with God and of the triumph of faith. Not all of his problems were solved, nor all his questions answered, but the crucial action was that Moses returned to where he belonged. He went to the only source of life and light. He returned to to the Lord. Oh, let Moses be an example for us today of what to do when you are underneath the burden and the struggle is heavy. Or are you not feeling good physically? Are you emotionally a wreck? Maybe spiritually you're being torn between two masters. And man, you've got all kinds of struggle going on. Turn to the Lord. Don't run to your slave master and say, please ease my burden. Run to the Lord and say, rescue me. Heal me. Deliver me. Bring me peace. Just like Moses did. There's another side of Moses here that I asked you not to copy. And I think we need to list that out there so, so we can see that as to what not to do today. Moses becomes, he's questioning God. And it's, you know, my thinking is when, not if, trouble comes. Who do you run to? Where, where do you go? And, and it makes you wonder if God really knows what he's doing in the first place. And Moses begins to, to quiz God. He says in verse 22, O oh Lord, why have you brought harm to this people? Why did you ever send me? Ever since I came to Pharaoh to speak in your name, he has done harm to this people, and you have not delivered your people at all. Now, <laughs> just stand before God like that? To question God in that manner? To begin to shift blame uh, toward God. This is what he's doing on the outward part of him. He's looking for somebody to blame. This is the secular counsel of the world. Let's just find a victim. Let's just find somebody else to put the blame on so I don't have to take any responsibility here. What responsibility could he take? He's in the right place at the right time with the right words and everything else seems to be falling apart. It's like God is ambushing him and he's, he's standing in the way. God is. You have 
not deliver your people at all. I think outwardly it should be blamed, but on the inside, isn't he saying what he just has already been trying to communicate to God? I told you so. I told you I'm not the guy. I told you I'm not the one for this job. I told you. I told you back in the burning bush when my face was in the dirt before that bush that was on fire and you were speaking me out of the bush. I'm not the God. This is not what I do. I was perfectly comfortable watching my father-in-law's sheep with my family. I've left my family. I've journeyed across this wilderness. I've gone to these people now. Pharaoh hates me. The people hate me. You're standing in the way of progress. Nothing is being done here. What is up with this? Nothing is working. I call Moses today a 3D uh, malcontent here because there's three Ds that explain what he's really dealing with. The first is discontent and then doubt and then despair. He's got all of them. Fill those in your blanks today because if you find yourself in this spot, this is what not to do when you are faced with this kind of affliction. The first is to go back and complain to God and disagree with all of God's methods. Lord, I don't like any of this. Somewhere you messed up. Then there's doubt. There's just unbelief that God will do what He says He can do. And then when, the, when all that happens, the outlook is not very good. We begin to despair. We fall into depression of sorts. Yet, I can't, I'm wondering, even though Moses is in the right place, he's doing the right thing, he's saying the right words, he's even been prepared for this because God has already told him, Pharaoh's not going to let you go unless he is compelled to do so. But I'm going to harden his heart, and then I'm going to harden his heart again, and then you're going to speak the words, you're going to be my mouthpiece to come to deliver them, but I'm going to make things difficult so I can really show myself to Pharaoh. Some early application questions for us as we deal with this. The first is this, and I asked you this last week. Do the allowances of God here for suffering outweigh the promises of God for deliverance? Or maybe a second question. Is God any less God when He's not doing what you want Him to do? Because there are plenty of times that God's allowing things to happen that I just assume to be over. Anybody else in the house today? God allows circumstances to happen, you're just like, uh... Excuse me, it's time. And when he doesn't show up, I've stopped singing songs about God showing up on time. <laughs> I don't do those kind of songs anymore because I don't believe that God is ever absent from that. You may feel like he showed up, but was he ever really asleep anywhere? Does he slumber anywhere? Is he forgetful in any way? No. Is he any less God? Because you struggle today. What do you want him to do? You know, our prayers are typically calling out to God, saying, Lord, save me, save me, save me, or deliver me from these circumstances. Very few times are they, God, thank you for this affliction. Because it's because you've afflicted me in this way that I'm able to cry out to you in a different way. I'm able to get to know you in a different manner. Thank you for the persecution. Thank you for the trial. I don't know if you've ever read Corey Ten Boom's uh, Hiding Place before. And when they were in that German uh, concentration camp, and they went into these barracks that were just flea-ridden and filthy and, and, and full of the worst of could possibly humanity could be made to suffer through. And then Corey's sister, Betsy, begins to pray and thank God for the fleas. Can you thank God for fleas in your life? Really? Have you ever been eaten up by fleas or infested with bed bugs or anything like that that just come and just, and it, if you haven't, how do you thank God for the fleas? And then Betsy began to explain to Corey, it's because these fleas are in here that the soldiers won't come in and afflict us. They won't come in and abuse us or take advantage of us. Can you thank God for the fleas without that knowledge? No. Can you thank God for the fleas when you understand that it's because of the fleas that you're not being abused even greater than you are yet. Who's in control of all that? I want you to know today, despite the things that we pick on with Moses here and all these questions of why, it's okay to cry out to God. Please don't run to anyone else. Pharaoh can't save you. Your doctor can't save you. Your pastor can't save you. Your, your spouse can't save you. They can't deliver you out of these afflictions and these troubles that you face. And you say, it's okay to cry out to God. If you read the prophets in the Old Testament, man, they are crying out to God. I'm saying what you told me to say, but they're not listening. Look at Jeremiah. Jeremiah's in a pit. 
And he's starving to death in a pit because he said, Thus saith the Lord. God told Isaiah to preach naked and to go through village to village and preach naked. And Isaiah's got to be wondering, it's a little embarrassing. I'm not crazy about that. I'd rather preach with clothes on. It's okay to cry out to God. We see Jesus himself on the cross. What's he say? My God, my God, what? Why? Why? You forsaken me. Here's the difference. When you want to question God, when you cry out to God, you must check your pride, your arrogance, your rebellious attitude at the door. Because if you come banging down the door, God, it's your fault. You're not going to get anywhere. You're not going to make it very far. Is it okay to cry out to him? Yes. But check your pride at the door because you are no rival for God. I like this uh, quote that I read from Douglas Stewart this week. He said, God's timing only sometimes coincides with our expectation. And his idea of the hardships we need to go through only sometimes coincides with our idea of how much we can take. Because you think, I can't handle any other thing. This is the heaviest it can be. And we've heard testimonies up here. Josh shared his testimony a few, several months ago. He said, I, I realized when I get to the bottom that the very bottom is the basement. And I realized it got harder and harder. Just when you think you can't handle any other thing, there's just something else that gets put on the pile. And God's not finished with you yet. <laughs> What else could happen? So we demand of God. We ask God why. We, and when we ask God why, we tend to want to put ourselves on the same level of God. That's why we're asking, Lord, share your thought with me. Share your ways with me. Bring me into the loop here. So I, I know you're busy, you know, keeping and sustaining this whole universe going on, but I want you to stop all that right now and just explain to me so I can understand what's going on here. And we demand of God. And I want to share with you one there's many things in there, but if you, if you live with nothing else, there's one significant truth about God in suffering that you really need to grab a hold of today. And that's this. The Creator doesn't owe you an explanation. That's what sovereignty is all about. That's what transcendent is all about. That's what holy is all about. He is other than. He is above. He is beyond anything that you can think or fathom. And He doesn't compare to anything else that you know. The Creator does not owe you an explanation or needs to justify His actions anything in His creation. He doesn't have to. It's Bible 101 to be able to open the Scriptures to see who God is in His creation, to see His activity, and see how He will bring His people to an absolute end of themselves so He can show Himself once again faithful and strong and trustworthy. So if you're a struggling saint of God today and you're enduring some stuff that's just really heavy, let me just ask you to stay. Step back and get out of His way. Trust Him to act. Now, once again, what do I say? It's easy to preach. Hard to what? Hard to live. I get it. Because man, when you're trudging through it, and that weight is on you, it is heavy. The first thing you want to do is just do anything to get this weight off of me. You can do anything to escape this conflict. Even if it means turning my back on God or keeping Him at arm's length just so I can find some relief. What kind of relief is it if God's not in? not. It's some temporary lightened thing. But with all of that in mind with chapter 5, and all the questions, and, and, and all the turning, and, and all the hopes that were up and now crashed uh, on, on the rocks, I mean, where do you turn to now? You flip the page. I have to flip the page. You may not have to. But what does it say in chapter 6? Then the Lord said to Moses, now you're going to see what I will do. And to me, that gives me goosebumps to think about. It gives me goosebumps to tell it to you. It gives me goosebumps in my office this week as I'm reading it, as I'm underlining it in the Bible. All right, I've heard enough. Now you're going to see what I am about to do. John Drew said, What has appeared to Moses and the Israelites as a serious deterioration of an already bad situation has been instead a careful preparation for what is to come. God has them exactly where He wants them. They don't see that. They think they've been abandoned by God. They don't see that yet because they all they've known is affliction and slavery. Us on this side of the Exodus know, hang on, y'all. You. <laughs> You're just a chapter and a half from some amazing things that are about to happen. But the story hasn't been written before. They're living it. And they're going through it. And if I could 
counsel you today, if I could spend some time talking to you about your issues and your problems and some, some of the things that you're facing today, let, let, me, let me tell you this, on this side of Calvary, on this side of the empty tomb, on this side of, of, of what we've seen about God, hang on, He's not finished yet. Can you trust Him today? Look back and see where you were before. And how he delivered you here, 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 and here. And now trust him enough to go, if he did it before, he'll do it again. That's what sovereignty is. It's a great picture of what God is as a sovereign God, as a transcendent one. Sovereign means all wise, all powerful. God has everything under control over all creation. And we're about to see that. He's, uh, he is Lord over the waters. He's Lord over the frogs and the gnats and the flies and the locusts and the storms and all the universe. And His very command and battle His will. The very Lord of life and death. Now remember, in our, in our story, Moses and Aaron are doing exactly what they're supposed to do. Right where they're supposed to be and saying the right things that they're supposed to do. But God has His own timetable. Listen to this quote today. Godliness does not guarantee immediate results. Just because you might be doing what God has set for you and ordained for you, it doesn't mean life's going to be easy. Oh, you could come to the altar today and surrender your life to, to the Lord and surrender to missions and, or surrender to ministry and, and, and say, Lord, wherever you want me, you planted me here in this job, you planted me in this family, you planted me in this neighborhood. Lord, I just want to shine as a beacon of light for you. That doesn't mean that you don't have to pay your bills tomorrow. <laughs> Or you're not going to get stuck in traffic on the way home from Nashville tomorrow. Or you're not going to have rebellious kids. Or you're not going to have a, a relationship that's just struggling and on the brink of, of, of separation. It doesn't mean all those things. Godliness does not guarantee immediate results for your happiness and your, your, your health. That's the lie, the damning lie of the health and wealth gospel that is being preached all over the world today. One of the most appalling things that I saw when we went to Kenya last year was, was, was not the poverty. It, it was not the, the, just a completely different culture and the struggle. One of the most appalling things that I saw were pastors trying to be Benny Hinn. Pastors preaching a message to a people over there that had no foundation in Scripture. They only heard what they seen. Their whole picture of, of a Christian pastor was what they see that's being piped into their airwaves wherever they can find a TV. And what do they see? They see TV in. And they see everybody telling you, look, if you'll just trust God, everything's going to work out perfectly for you. You're going to be healthy. You're going to be wealthy. You're going to be whole. And you're going to get all the things that you need because God wants you to be happy. That's what they're trying to tell their people. And we open the scriptures for them and say, this is not the case. We'll go back this year. We're going to try to tell them the same, same things, encourage them along the way. It's going to get hard. It's going to get hard. Godliness does not guarantee immediate results. Godliness does not. You may be doing exactly what you're supposed to be doing, but it might still take some time. Why? Because God wants to show you something. And He wants to prove that only He can save you. And if you'll trust Him and you'll, you'll depend on Him, He's the one that's going to, to, to bring all this together for His sake and His name and His glory. I, don't, I wish I had a picture I put on the screen for you today. But back in, in the Bible times, they, uh, olives were uh, a major industry. And the olive oil that would be produced from the olives uh, were, were used for, for medicines and, and used for, for, for healing wounds and and anointing kings and olive oil was just a huge thing. And the way they did it is they would take all the olives off the trees and they would dump them in this big conk or this big stone uh, trough that they would put it in. And they put this massive stone down in the trough and then they would tie it to an animal or some slaves would have to push it, but they would go around in circles. And this big stone would just be crushing these olives. There'd be a little hole in the side where all the juice would flow out of there and into the pitchers that they had prepared. And then they could sell it and they could they could give it away, they would use it for, for medicinal purposes, whatever they would use it for. And so, but the whole idea of that, of that press is it's squeezing out and crushing out all of the juice out of the olives. So it can be used for healing, it can be used for all, all different types of things that they used. And so, when we look at what God is doing in us, He comes in as a press, and He is pressing out all me to make room for all of him. 
if there's anything left of Ross in here, he's going to continue to press, press, and press. Now, at the end of the day, I think our prayers are usually, I don't want to wait. I don't want to be patient. I don't trust your time. I don't like the methods. I don't like the pain. I don't like all these things. And because we don't like it, and because it's hurtful, because it's, we don't understand it, we want to flee from it. And it's as if God is reading their minds. He says, look, now you're going to see what I will do. Oh, let me, let me share with you. And for the next few verses, God begins to lay out a whole plan for what is about to happen and why. Look at it in verse 2. He says, God spoke further to Moses and said to him, I am the Lord. I am the Lord. If it's capitalized L-O-R-D in your scripture, that means he's talking about Yahweh. He's introducing himself four times. He says that I am the Lord. Before God begins His activity, before He begins to, to share with Him, He's reminding them again, I am the God of your fathers, of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I'm the one that started this nation. I'm the one that took you, this rabble of you, and I brought you from a foreign land. I brought you to this place. Yes, I've allowed you to endure this for a season, but I'm about to act. And I'm going to show you what I'm going to do. And He, he, he says to them in verse 3, I appeared... To Abraham. In verse 4, I have established my covenant. In verse 5, he says, I have heard the groanings and I have remembered my covenant. Fill those in your blanks today because here comes the activity of God. This is what he's done in the past. I appeared to them, I have established with them, I have heard them, and I've remembered my covenant. Because he's forgotten? No, because now is the time for God to act. Now is the time God says, I'm ready to honor the terms of the covenant that I made with you. Here comes the application. I'm not simply remembering something that I've forgotten. I'm ready to apply to you what my end of the bargain is, what my deal is. In verse 3, by my name, I will do it. I did not make myself known to them as Yahweh, as this kind of God, back in the days of your forefathers. But today, I'm getting ready to show you something brand new about myself. To the forefathers and the patriarchs and, and all the ones that are there now, they've only known God as a promise maker. But they're about to discover Him as a promise Keeper. Please keep that in mind today because what God says He will do. And I'll, I'll look at this language and go, man, I've heard this before. I, I feel like I've, I've seen this before. And sure enough, God was there at the, at the burning bush. God was there back in the days of Abraham going, I am your God and you will be my people. I'm establishing a covenant with you and you're going to have things to do and I'm going to have things to do. But why does He repeat it here again? It's as if Moses needed to hear it another time. Moses needed to be reminded so the people could be reminded so we would be reminded that when God says something and then He repeats it and then He says it again, does He really want us to know about it? Let me ask you guys in here, how many of you guys told your children when they were first, let's say two or three toddlers, now let's give them a little bit more time, let's give them six or seven years old and you told them their main job is to clean their room and empty the trash. You told them that on their sixth birthday and for the rest of their life they didn't have any problem with that. <laughs> Anyone? Or do you have to constantly remind them in various ways of getting their attention, so to speak, to remind them that this is their responsibility, this is what they do. It reminds of the relationship. And I'm the father, you are the son. It reminds of, of what can happen when we disobey and, and, and we move outside of, of what God... God is doing that. He says again, this is who I am and this is what I've done. For you, and this is what I am about to do for you. I think we need the reminder for us to give us courage, to, to bring us comfort, to confirm the relationship that God has planted in us and started in us. I need it. I need the reminder. And I want the reminder. I want God to keep whispering in, into my ear. I want Him to, to continue to surround me with His love and say, I'm the God who was there when your heart was broken. I'm the God that was there when you got that bad news at the doctor. I was there and I've been comforting you and I've been lifting you when you despaired. I'm the God that bore the cross for you and endured the shame for you and was forsaken by God for you. Let me make it personal. God said I was there on that day when you should have died. My parents tell me this story when I was I think a little less than two years old. Um, I was crying. I was in my car seat in the back seat, and I was making a fuss and, and crying. And, and, um, and 
just couldn't be settled down. And, and so they pull over the side of the road, and this little two-lane country road in Kentucky. And so mom picks me up and just takes me in the front seat. She's holding me and trying to, to soothe me. Again, I'm just, just a baby. And, and um, so they get started back on the road, and just not less than a mile or two down the road, they, they come around a really sharp curve, and there's one of those big trucks with a big combine just all over the road. And I mean, it is near collision as they come around this sharp curve. Dad has to take the car over on the side of the road. In Kentucky, you have ditches on the sides of the road. I don't know, in some places you still have them here. Once you get out Highway 25 on your way up to Portland, it's like you're here on the road and there's a little drop off over there. And so that's what it was. So Dad takes the car over into this ditch to avoid him, and the car's bumping and everything like that. So he overcorrects to get back on the road, and the car flips over the road a couple of times and into the ditch on the other side. And man, they come and they get settled making sure I'm all right, making sure they're all right, and no one was, was, was injured, and the guy in the truck had stopped, and he'd come back, I think, to check on them, and, um, and they're looking around to make sure everything is all right, and there's the whole windshield's crashed, and there's a big hole in the middle of the windshield, made by the car seat that used to be in the back seat, and has now flown through the windshield of the front car, it's now laying out in the field. And as, I, as my mother looked at that, knowing that I was safe and held in her arms, he couldn't help but think, what if? What if they had waited one more curve? You're probably thinking, I'll be at lunch by now. If. <laughs> <laughs> what if? And you can think about all those what ifs and that coincidence. I want the God to keep reminding me, I'm your God. I've established a covenant with you, and I'm not going to let you go. And I know it's hard, but I'm, I'm the, the same God that was in the back seat that day. I'm the God that was on the front row with you when you were sitting by yourself in that little country church, and I whispered your name, and I called you to salvation. I'm the God that was sitting right next to you when you were 16 years old in the back of that concert hall, and I began to whisper, to you, this is the way I'm going to use you to serve me and my kingdom. I was 20 years old, hearing the voice of God whisper again, I'm going to take you to a new land, I'm going to take you to a new place, I'm going to take you to a new home and show you what I'm about to do with you. And every, every, uh, all of us, couldn't we all testify? We look back and go, he was there, 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 every single step of the way. Did I realize it in the moment? No, I didn't. on the screen that I can come and I can be wrapped up in the arms of the Savior. I've got you. I've got you. You are not ever too far from me that I can't save you. That I can't rescue you. And I want Yahweh, I want Christ to, to be there to tell me that. To tell me that His covenant is not till death parts us. But until death unites us. In glory, and this old sinful world will be passed, and we will be in his arms forever and ever and ever. God introduces himself again, he reminds him of who I am. I am the great I am, and I am the one that has come to, to heal you and to rescue you. Let me show you a little bit more how I'm going to do it. And in verse 6, 7, and 8, the great I am says, I will. If you like to mark in your Bible, get your pen handy, and I want you to start circling some stuff in the Bible. All right? In verse 6, he says, Say therefore to the sons of Israel, I am the Lord, I am Yahweh, and I will. There's the first one. I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. And I will deliver you from the bondage. I will also redeem you with an outstretched arm with great judgments. This is the rescue plan of God. This is the salvation. This is what He's about to do. I'm going to bring you out. I'm going to deliver you. And I'm going to redeem you. That means I'm going to pay for you. I'm going to, I'm going to buy you back. He's had you on the slave market. But I'm going to buy you back and claim you for my own. This is the rescue plan. In verse 7, He gives the covenant application of this. Then I will take you for my people. And I will be your God. See that I will. So I will take you for my people. And I will be your God. And you will know that I am the Lord. This is the idea of being adopted. We've been taken out of, of 
being far away, being far from God. Now we've been included in the family of God. But he's not finished in verse 8. He gives us the, the promised inheritance. He says, I will bring you to the land which I swore to give to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And I will give it to you for possession. My cup, one of our elders in the church caught me in the lobby after the service. He said, did you notice right after that that he didn't tell them they had to do anything? He said, notice right after this text, he said, he didn't ask them to do anything. He said, I will bring you out. I will deliver you. I will redeem you. I'm going to take you for my own. I'm going to bring you to the land. And I'm going to give it to you for possession. This is all God. This is the great I am saying, I will. It's a great verse in 1 Peter chapter 2. Uh, it's worthy of, of memory. But he says that you, now, all of his adopted uh, uh, children, uh, the, the Gentiles and the Jews, all of us now are a chosen race, a holy nation, a royal priesthood. He said, a people of my own possession. And I'm going to, I've taken you out of darkness and put you into light, I'm transferring you into my family, adopting you into my family. And not just for this life, you were once not a people, but now you are a people. You once had not obtained mercy, but now you've received the mercy of God. And you would think that the people would erupt and go, that is exactly what we need to hear. That's exactly what we need to please keep reminding us, keep this before us. We need that. We need that. Yes, we're ready. We're ready. We're ready. But look at verse 9. So Moses spoke this to the sons of Israel, but they did not listen. So the great I am says, I will, but the people of I am say, I won't. I won't. And they did not listen. The scripture says because of their despondency and their broken spirit and their cruel bondage. You see, back in chapter 4, they dared to get their hopes up, didn't they? Only to see things get drastically worse in chapter 5. And now they're not going to make that mistake again. God has revealed himself again. This is who I am. This is what I've done. This is what I'm doing. This is what I'm about to do. They're not going to be trampled on again. Here's my heart, Lord. Take it. It's crushed. No, I'm not going to do that again. I'm not going to give you my heart again. Physically, emotionally, willfully, turn their, their back on the Lord and did not listen. The physical bondage and the broken backs would have been severe. Would have been severe people dying every day underneath the, the lash of the whip, the starvation, the lack of water, the heavy labors, and physically they just could not give up themselves. Emotionally they've been up, they've been down, they've been up, they've been down, they just can't handle no broken heart. Thirdly, I just set their will against it. Not my their spirit had been so broken by Pharaoh. That all they knew was slavery. <clears throat> Spurgeon said, Some cannot receive Christ because they're so full of anguish, they're so crushed in spirit that they cannot find strength enough of mind to entertain the hope that by any possibility salvation can come to them. The mere struggle to exist exhausted all their energy and destroyed all their hope. After the promise of God, to the spokesman of God, visually seeing the great works and the power of God, the people were not impressed. They were not moved enough to follow and believe. What happened to the worshipers at the end of chapter 4? They're too despondent and too broken now to give of themselves anymore. Douglas Stewart said that optimism is often dashed by suffering and faith is often diminished by hardship. Sometimes it's just a stubborn, willful, rebellious spirit to go, no. You didn't help me when I needed you. So I'm done with you. You didn't help me when I really wanted you back there, when I really needed you to show up, so I, I'm not with you anymore. It's just the Romans 1 testimony that can see the evidence of God in all creation, all around them, hardwired in their own hearts and their own spirits to worship the God that they can see clearly evidence to creation, but it says in Romans when they exchange the truth of God for a lie. They exchange the glory of the Creator for the lesser glory of the created. And they trade it out. So how can anyone be saved? How can anyone come to the truth? How can anyone that is so broken, 
so despondent, so crushed inside. How could they ever be saying, let me tell you this, it was never your own ability in the first place. It was never your joys and your hopes and your dreams that ever brought you salvation in the first place. Theologians call this the doctrine of total inability. There's an inability to come to God on our own. That's what it means. That, that because of our brokenness, because we've been shattered on the rocks, because we've been so hurt and, and wounded in our hopes and dreams that have been to, where we're struggling in despair and depression, how in the world are you going to pick yourself up out of that and say, I want to serve another God today? Totally unable to come. This is what regeneration is all about. Being brought to life, being born again. You cannot come to God on your own. So if you're waiting for things to get better before you get things right with God, man, you're in for a long, dry spell. If you'd like to do math, I'd encourage you to go back and count between verses 1 and 12 today. You can do that some other time. But 20, I'll do the math for you. 25 times. There are 25 personal pronouns used for God in either what He has done, what He's doing, or what He's about to do. God is pretty evident here in chapter 6. No matter what's happening to them in chapter 5, God is pretty evident in chapter 6 that He is on the precipice of doing something incredible. But they wouldn't listen. The people missed it because they feared Pharaoh. Moses missed it because he feared the people. Ultimately, they missed the revelation of God, the introduction of God, because their fear and their focus was on only their current circumstances. Their personal inadequacy. It's too heavy. It's too hard. I can't do this, Moses says. Of course you can. The slaves would say, there's no way we can free ourselves from this bondage. And God says, of course you can. You're right. You can't free yourself from this. You're totally incapable of saving yourselves. But I am, God. I am. I'm going to do it for you. Now you're going to do it today. I want to talk at you for just one closing second again. Without even about looking around, this is time for reflection and invitation to respond a bit to what God is showing us in His Word and His text today. I'm not of the opinion as I read what I read here that there's anything that I can do. And it goes so much against my nature to want to fix things. You have a problem, I want to fix it for you. Let me just give you some advice. You have a problem here, let me just give you some money. Let me help you out. You have some problems and you, you, you just feel like you're under, underneath the, the, the weight of things. Let me just come and, and help ease your burden. And let me just try to fix things. And, and you know what? I can't fix me and I can't fix you. We're totally incapable of our own self. To save ourselves. To rescue ourselves. To pick ourselves up anyway. But I ask you today, if you would just remember who the God of the Bible is and how He has introduced Himself today as the great I Am, the one who is with you, the one who is going to remember His covenant with you and the one who is about to pour out His blessing and His favor and rescue you. Let Him fill your heart. Let Him fill your appetite and your longings. Let, let, let Him be your all in all and you will not want for any other thing. Are you confused today? Perplexed, bewildered? He's not the author of that. Are you weary? Are you burdened? Are you, are you, are you weighted down? Listen to the words of the Savior. He says, Come to me, all you who are weary. Find rest in me. They could just be simple words on the page to you today. They'll go in one ear and they'll go out the other. Or they could be words of life. Salvation. Because wherever you are, He sees it. He knows it. He'll come alongside. And then by the time you leave this place today, as you're in your dealings with the Lord this week, you can say, I am no longer who the world says I am. I'm no longer who my slave master says 
I was. I'm not a slave to my fear anymore. I'm not a slave uh, to, to my circumstances anymore. I'm not going to be held in bondage by, by the liar Satan anymore. I'm going to be who God says I am, and that's His child. And when things are dark and things are, 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 are I don't know where things are going and, and I don't understand everything, then yeah, we know that we're his child. We can trust him like we've always been able to be his faith. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for the revelation of yourself in your word. May you come once again today and remind us that no matter what, we are never far from you. We are never so far that you can radically say and reach out for your children. Thank you for saving us and delivering us from our fear and our bondage and our slavery. You are our God. And we are your people. And we praise your name in Jesus' name.